Hello to the Fredericksburg City Public Schools community. Thank you for tuning in to our first restart the school year town hall meeting. We certainly appreciate your questions, your support, and your patience while we have been trying to recover, redesign, and restart the academic school year for 2020-2021. I'd like to introduce you to the participants in our town hall. The panel includes our school board chairperson, Ms. Mrs. Janet Holmes. It includes our newest member to our team, Dr. Matthew Eberhardt. We welcome here as the interim deputy superintendent. It includes Ms. Laura Lori Bridey, who is our chief academic officer. It also includes Mr. Mike George. He is our chief operation and communications officer, as well as our also new member to our team, Mr. Tom Weed, who is our director of equity and inclusion. Thank you all for being here today. Mrs. Holmes, I'd like for you to say a few words to our community, please, from the school board. Thank you, Dr. Catlett. Um, what I want to remind everybody today is that we are all in this together, that we all worry about COVID-19 and the effects of COVID-19 on our community and our children, and we are all committed to our city's children and their education. Our students and our staff safety are and have to be our top priority. On behalf of the board, I would like to thank our staff for their hard work and thoughtful plan on how to best educate our students safely in the fall and this year. Thank you for your involvement and your patience as we move forward. Thank you, Ms. Holmes. Yes, the well-being, health, and safety of our students and staff that will be our top priority as we plan to provide the academic program to educate our students. With that, I'll give you a brief overview of what's happened since the July school board meeting. The school board was presented the draft reopening plan on um, the July school board meeting, and we also changed the start date for the school year from the 10th to the 17th. And we're now going to have a special school board meeting on the 23rd, Thursday, to have the board approve the actual health plan as well as the instructional plan that now includes a recommendation to provide distance learning 100% um, throughout the first nine weeks. So at this point, we have received close to 30 questions, and we will provide you with responses. Um, starting now. So please, first question. Hello, my name is Lisa Nagy. Um, and my question is, um, is the distance learning going to be different than when school closed? Or is it going to be the same PowerPoint um, module, modules that they had um, at the end of last year um, and if it and if so if it is going to be different um, is there going to be um, a video learning uh, I mean like the the video calling like a, a virtual a video classroom a video chat classroom or something. Um, I'm just wondering how how this school year is going to be. Okay, Ms. Bridey. Thank you so much for that question. Um, I'm glad that the module question is one of the first ones that we are going to address today. 
The modules that we had when we closed at the end of the school year last year in March, those modules were in reaction to uh, where we were at the time with our knowledge um, of instructional online platforms as well as us being unsure when we were going to actually be able to come back to school if we were going to be able to come back to school. And so those modules were not intended to be online instruction. So with that in mind, we are excited that we have a platform for this school year that is called Virtual Virginia. It is a platform that allows us to use Canvas and that platform will provide instruction for all students starting in kindergarten through grade 12 where students access online learning from their teachers. In regards to training, at the back to school events we will have opportunities for students and families to learn more about that Canvas online platform as well as ask their teachers any questions that they may have. We will be practicing social distancing during those events, so that information is clearly outlined in the reopening plan. Thank you. That's Brian. Next question. Yes, uh, good afternoon. I guess my question would be, my name is Eliana Negron, and I have a student at the high school. I am immunocompromised, and I'm wondering if city council and the school board continue to have virtual meetings, how is it possible that you would even consider sending our children, especially the little ones, who we know that um, sometimes can be kind of careless in regards to hygiene, sneezing, coughing, wiping their nose. Um, I just want to ask this board if they feel comfortable sending these kids to school and then allowing them to come back home to be around their family members that might be compromised um, in regards to the COVID-19. So yet, if you're still having virtual meetings, why are we sending our kids to school? I guess that would be my question. Thank you. Ms. Holmes? I want to thank you for that question, and I think um, it is timely. We thought that we would be able to have our students back in the classroom, you know, with half of our students at a time, um, and that that would be safe for our students and our teachers, but we have postponed that until the second nine weeks at the earliest. So right now we agree that that would not be a safe plan and that we will try again second nine weeks. Thank you. Thank you. Next question, please. Hello, my name is Avery LaBelle. My daughter is going to be enrolled in the online distance learning for this coming up school year. My question is, since she's online, if our situation changes or if the state situation changes and we want to go to the 60-40, are we allowed to do that? Thank you. Laurie, please. What? <laughs> so, in regards to switching between the distance learning plan and the hybrid plan, you will be allowed to switch anytime that you need to. However, we do request that we get at least a week in order to help make that transition between your student and their learning group so that when they transition back into the regular classroom with other students that we have in, in the appropriate group. Also, please note that if we do have students that are making that switch, they will be responsible to continue with the online learning until they actually start their face-to-face -face instruction. Thanks. Next question. Hi, my name is Bonnie Spinner, and my daughter will be going to James Monroe. This is, would be her first year in the ninth grade. And I have a two-part question. The first part of my question is, this virus is still out here, and I've had problems with the Fredericksburg school system before. So I don't understand why we don't do distance learning and have the teachers in the classrooms by themselves while the kids are online as if they were in school. That would be the easiest way to handle and control this. Secondly, if that is not done, my daughter is not coming to school because I don't trust the Fredericksburg school system with my child's safety. And if y'all are attempting to do some waiver like Missouri for me to sign and say my child dies, oh, well, y'all not responsible, I wouldn't do that. Again, my name is Bonnie Spinner, and I had those questions. Why don't we 
let the teachers go to school just as if they're getting up to go to school and the kids are going to report. But the kids stay at home and they get up just like they're going to school and they get online with the teachers they have for that class period and do it just like and do their day just like they were in school. Thank you for the question and comments. And that is just why we've reconsidered our um, draft plan and we'll be um, implementing the distance learning uh, process throughout the first nine weeks. Thank you. My name is Carla Hagler and my question is, how are you going to protect my children during the school year from contracting COVID from other students or a teacher? Um, good question. And um, first of all, we're, we're planning if we do reopen to be at 50% capacity uh, based off of the uh, guidelines that have been given to us by the state. Uh, we also have uh, plans for minimum capacity, which would be 25%. Um, if the community uh, percent positive goes over six and a half percent, we also have thresholds put in there that if community um, positive tests are over 8%, uh, that we will all automatically return back to distance learning. Uh, no matter what. And then we also have plans in the system that if we have one positive case in any of the schools, that that automatically triggers that school to be closed for 14 days. And uh, I'll see if Matt wants to add anything. I, I do want to add that we're, we have spent a lot of time planning for custodians to clean um, and how we would transport students. Part of the reason that we wanted the delay to go online um, distance learning for the first nine weeks is to give us more time to buy the materials that we need to buy, um, to develop the training plans that need, to be, that need to be developed and train our custodians and folks on how we're gonna clean our buildings to make sure that they're absolutely the safest places possible and also to navigate um, transportation and moving kids and how we do that in the safest way possible. Okay, thank you. Next question. Hi, this is Kathy Anderson. I have a question about the middle school level uh, for online instruction, virtual instruction for that track. I have a question about will students have the uh, virtual and to be optional, classroom virtual. So if there are assignments that they are working on at their own pace, is any portion of interaction with teachers online something that is required to attend at a particular time, such as a Zoom meeting, or will there be flexibility to set their own schedule and, um, and primarily set their own schedule. So if online virtual instruction with the teacher is set at a particular time, um, then the question is, does the student have to show up at a certain time for that class? And how will that conflict with other classes that that student may also be uh, scheduled for? So um, I'm hoping there's flexibility and wanted to know if the school has looked at that yet. Thanks. Ms. Bryan. That is a question that we get asked often and so I'm really glad to have the opportunity to clarify that when the students are doing distance learning, it will be asynchronous. And so what that means is they may have access to a pre-recorded lesson or to chat boards that people have been working on at other times. The distance learning option is not, in, is not intended to have students log in during their normal class time. The reason for that is we're very concerned about equitable access for students. And so if we force everyone in the household to get online during the same school day at the same time, we are not sure, one, that the internet with the lags may um, keep up with that for home as well as the number of devices that are available at home. So distance learning will be completely at the student's pace during those distance learning days. 
Thank you. Yes. But I think it's important to say that we also want students to connect with classmates or connect with their teachers as well. Their social emotional um, learning is just as important. So we, we look forward to any opportunity that we can to um, connect Based the teacher on, and the on student. The, on the distance learning. Absolutely. There is an opportunity for interaction, um, many opportunities for interaction through the virtual platform. Um, however, the teachers will have office hours every day, 11.30 to 1.30 during the week. Um, they may also have other things that are set up in order to meet the students' work needs or the family's needs, but at least 11.30 to 1.30 every day, teachers will be available. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else want to add? All right, next question. Hi, my name is Charles Koch. I'm a resident of Fredericksburg City, and I am very concerned that any indoor interactions uh, should uh, require mask com compliance. Uh, what will Fredericksburg City Schools do to address mask compliance? Uh, our students required to wear masks as they enter the building after their temperature is checked. Uh, any student that does not comply should have to leave the school is, is my uh, take on that since they're not participating in a group community safety effort. Uh, so my question again is, you know, uh, will masks be required by the students. I know that staff will be required to wear them. Uh, it seems like anybody indoors should wear a mask. Thank you. Mr. George? Sure. Um, well, first of all, if uh, a student wants to utilize Fredericksburg City Schools transportation, um, masks will be required on buses uh, based off of of the guidance that we have from the Rappahannock Health District and the Virginia, Depart uh, Virginia Department of Education. As far as in schools, um, masks are going to be worn by students when developmentally um, and medically appropriate. Uh, all staff members are asked to wear a mask, or required to, I should say, required to wear a mask as well um, with, uh, when they're in, within six feet of another uh, person or um, if they are in common areas. So um, just in general, though, that we're going to have all of our staff members wear masks, period. That, that is going to be the general rule uh, with that. Is there uh, anything else? Anyone else want to add? Well, I would just add that we want everyone to wear a mask. It, it's safe. It, it just seems common sense to me. Um, what are we going to do if someone refuses? Well, we'll probably have to look at that on a case-by-case -case basis. But regardless, wh why wouldn't you want to wear a mask when, when we come back together? It's, it's for the common good and common safety, in my mind. Mm -hmm. And of course, we'll keep in mind the developmental level of the students. But certainly, safety is the first priority. Yes. I would just like to add that that's something that really parents could help out a lot with by practicing at home right now. That younger students, of course, it feels awkward at first, but when you've been coming to work as long as we have and wearing a mask, it's not such a big deal anymore. And so we really hope that the parents are asking their students to practice that at home also. Thanks. Yeah, but <laughs> I should also add that in regards to anyone entering the building, including parents, that everyone will be required to wear face coverings in compliance with the safety guidelines that we are receiving. Also, any student who finds it difficult to keep their face covering on as developmentally appropriate, we will um, have conversations with families and administration and the teachers to discuss whether or not that face-to-face -face hybrid option is appropriate for the student to continue. Thank you. I'd also like to add that um, as a district, we have purchased alternative face coverings for students uh, who have individual needs and aren't unable to wear the traditional face covering. Thank you both. Okay, next question. Hi, my name is Elizabeth Kelly. My question is if we go 100% distance learning, what about special education students and faculty and staff? 
So bringing them into schools can also expose their, the students and the faculty and staff. So that's um, really not a fair situation. And so what will you do in regards to the, that population and those teachers? Um, thank you very much. Bye-bye. Mr. Weed? Okay. Mr. Weed? Excellent question. So obviously we take the safety of our staff, of our students, um, very seriously. We're going to be working with our special education staff to make sure that we are meeting the individual needs of every single student and that we're providing an equitable um, educational experience for every single student. We do envision, or at least we are, are trying to come up with a way so that we can get our students with special needs back into the schools sooner than October 14th. Of course, we have to have all of our you know, mitigation strategies in place, as well as the equipment that uh, Dr. Everhart referenced earlier. Once we are confident that we can safely do so, we will start to transition our students with special needs back in, as well as um, our English language learners and, uh, and hopefully other students who have individual needs that will require them to be in school. Thank you. Next question, please. Yes, my name is Gloria Taharam. I would like uh, my voice here, and I'm wondering about the kids going back in that coronavirus. Really, I don't want my granddaughter in school. We are going to do, I guess, school by the computers. Yes. Thank you for your, um, your statement and your concern is shared by many. Um, all of our students will be doing virtual learning, distance learning, distance learning on starting Oct until October 19th. Um, but any parent or guardian can choose distance learning for the entire year. Thank, Thank you. you. Next question. Hi, yes, this is Jane Yawn. Um, I have a few questions. Will the virtual learning be synchronous or asynchronous? What platform will it be used? And if it's not virtual Virginia, is there a way to work with the school to be able to access virtual Virginia? I also have a question about electives such as orchestra. Renting an instrument um, seems sort of silly if we go virtual. So I'm wondering about orchestra as well as chorus and art in a virtual atmosphere. And then finally, the question is about honor society applications for a rising eighth grader. How will that be uh, handled? Oh, and I'm sorry, one more question. Would there be a possibility of any sort of clubs occurring virtually um, that could be facilitated by a teacher or even by a parent um, so that the kids can stay connected? Thank you very much, and thank you for all the hard work that you're doing during these times. Okay. Ms. Pryde. Thank you for your questions. In regards to the platform that we will be using, it is Virtual Virginia, and all of our students will have access to that. However, the Virtual Virginia platform has pre-canned programs as well as an opportunity for our teachers to create their own lessons through that. And so you may see a combination of, of both of those things being used throughout the distance learning time. In regards to fine arts and um, orchestra, art, those types of things, instruments, we are still working on figuring out all of those logistics in regards to honor society and applications for those types of things, including clubs and, and the such, those are all extracurricular things that we are still working out the logistics of. Thanks. Okay. Next question, please. Well, I, I, oh. I did want to add, um, I think until this question came up, I hadn't really been thinking about clubs. I think it is so important that those extracurriculars, when done safely, um, it's something that we're providing for our students. and I, you know, I, I would, you know, wholeheartedly champion any way that we could figure out parents stepping up or our adults stepping up to do clubs for kids. I think there's more to school um, than just the virtual learning modules. There are other things that we can do. And boy, I was excited to see this this question because I hadn't thought about that before. 
Yes, and we do have staff, our paraprofessionals that can assist us with that, and um, other staff as well with their expertise. So we certainly will keep that in the radar. Okay, thank you. Next question. Yes. My name is Jared Swearingen, and I wanted to leave a question. Uh, my first question is, has Fredericksburg City Schools partnered with and funded Virginia Virtual Academy so that parents can begin the enrollment process and move forward with Virginia Virtual Academy at no cost to parents? Uh, my second question, kind of two questions, is if Fredericksburg City Schools has partnered with Virginia Virtual Academy, what interaction, if any, will students have with local teachers for families that choose to go with that option uh, 100%? Will students singularly work with Virginia Virtual Academy teachers, or will students have some interaction with local teachers beyond just the required standardized tests? Ms. Bryan? That's a really excellent question, and it, it brings up a, a point that's often confused for families. Virginia Virtual Academy is different than Virtual Virginia. So for Virtual Virginia, you remain a student in Fredericksburg City Public Schools. However, for Virtual Virginia Academy, that is an online academy that students actually withdraw from Fredericksburg City Public Schools and they enroll in one of three other districts, King and Queen, Richmond City, and unfortunately I can't remember the third one. But you actually leave us and become their students and then they take over all of that. So you get assigned to classes and teachers through that school division, not through us. Thanks. All right, thank you. Next question. Hi, my name is Jessica Clark. Um, two of my questions are, one, what is your advice for full-time working toward a specific nanny um, or child care that's going to be able to help provide the education? And my second question is, what type of education are we looking at? Is it going to be live? Is it going to be all modules like we did in the spring, like what is the setup for the online education? Thank you. Okay. Dr. Everhart, you want to speak to the child care component? I do. Thank you for that question. Uh, we've been working with three groups um, right now to determine child care and how we can provide help to parents. Those three groups are um, Miniland, which currently has a um, a program in our schools with the YMCA, which has been providing child care services in the summer for our essential workers um, with medical, um, the medical workers. And then third, we've reached out to the Boys and Girls Club. I wish I could give you more information right now, but unfortunately I can't. We, we're hoping to be making some of those decisions this week, but absolutely we're looking at um, child care um, opportunities for, for parents and staff. Thank you. There was a question about the distance learning. Um. Sure. Thank you. Because we are unsure of what families will do in regards to child care, and we certainly do not want to impact your child care selection based upon their access to the internet, we do have the distance learning set up as something that can be done at a time that's convenient not only for the student and the family but also based upon when you can reasonably access that the internet so we don't want to put that burden on daycares however it is certainly something that you could consider having a conversation with your daycare provider about i also feel like now would be a great time for mr george to talk about uh, the possibility of getting some internet at other sites uh, yeah, thank you. Um, we we are still working with Cox Comcast uh, throughout the city uh, to provide low cost internet. So anyone that needs internet access, um, basically what it is is Home Essentials, uh, they can still receive that for $10 a month and we can provide the documentation to do that. Uh, we are also um, providing um, hotspots throughout the city in, in densely populated communities. So we, we will have a map of those in our plan as well. And as we deploy those, that, that'll get updated on our website. And then um, hopefully at some point in the near future, we'll, we'll get some confirmation from the FCC and may be able to um, provide internet directly to the homes. But uh, that's still um, under, under uh, the works right now. So um, yeah, thanks. Thank you. Next question. 
Hello, my name is Keisha Judge, and I'm a teacher with Fredericksburg City Schools. And my questions are as follows. What happens, not if, but when, someone in the school building tests positive for COVID-19? Will staff and parents be notified promptly of a possible case? Will the building shut down for at least two weeks for a deeper cleaning and to prevent possible spread? Many other school districts are pushing back their start date way further than ours. Shouldn't we push back ours further? Most teaching staff returning together, I feel is unsafe. Can we stagger the staff's reporting in the building? Kind of like have some come into the school building and others teach online with a rotation? Will there be an abundance of PPE? like disposable gowns and face shields? Would that be provided for nurses, preschool staff, maybe special ed staff who may need to tend to students' needs on a more closer, personal level? And my last area of question is, can temperature checks for students be done before boarding school buses in the morning where the weather is still pretty cool? And at school entry points, if temperature checks are done in the classrooms, I feel sick children would possibly already have spread the virus throughout the school building. Those are my questions. Thank you for listening. Goodbye. Okay. Mr. George. Sure. There's a, there's a lot to get through there, so I'll, I'll start. Um, uh, yes, we, we are, um, as we mentioned before, starting uh, virtually. And so our, our students won't be um, arriving to school until um, October 19th as of right now. And, and that obviously could change based off of conditions in our area. Um, staggering st uh, staff arrivals, we're, we're going to um, request that they use multiple entrances and, and that they don't all appear at the same time. That, that is absolutely uh, true. As far as PPE, um, we will have every classroom outfitted uh, with at least a initial supply of 100 masks as well as hand sanitizer and, and other equipment. Uh, and the same thing with the buses as well, having masks available on, on each one of the buses for any student that doesn't have their own. Um, temperature checks was a, is a difficult conversation that we've had uh, multiple times. Um, it, it, it goes all about student safety and risk uh, analysis. And, and so we're, we're first calling on parents to, to make sure they're, they're checking the temperature of their children and making sure they're not sick before they arrive at school. Um, that really should be our first line of defense. Everything past that is us just ensuring the safety of the students. Um, having the temperature checks done on the bus isn't practical, nor is it safe. Uh, to put the bus driver or a bus monitor in that situation, along with the fact that if, if a student does check high, we don't know the reasoning behind it, whether it was hot outside or, or the other factor. Um, temperature checks also at the door is, is really a safety thing as well, because students, um, we don't want them congregated together. Uh, putting them in a, a dense area with them, not social distancing, uh, for instance, if it's raining outside and there's not enough room for them all to come inside at the same time, um, actually puts them at a higher risk than it would um, not doing it. So at the classroom seems to be the best location as of right now, but we'll reevaluate that as we go through. Um, but it, it's more of a secondary check. It should not be the primary check. The parents really should be the primary ones uh, checking the temperature of their, of their children. Um, as far as school closure goes, uh, we, we do have very clear guidelines. Uh, if there is one case in any building, that will automatically prompt a school closure uh, for that single school for 14 days. Um, so yes, uh, we, we've thought of that as well. Thanks. Thank you. Next question. Hi, my name is Laura LaBelle. My daughter will be attending Humerfer. Um, for the second, her second grade year. Um, we did choose the 100% distance learning option. And I'm curious about what that schedule is going to look like for her um, and how many students um, will be in her class 
and uh, what sort of supplies we would need. Thank you. Ms. Bryden. Thanks for that question. So in regards to student supplies, first of all, let's handle that piece. They will have typical school supply lists. Those will be coming out. We are going to do some re uh, revisions to those lists because we want to be sure that you know which things are required and um, have to go home with the child every day as part of the hybrid once we actually start learning face-to-face. In regards to the class sizes, we can expect that the class sizes will be the same. However, this classes, based upon how many kids we're allowed to bring in with face-to-face -face learning, the groups of students will be smaller. So we might take a class of, say, 20 students and divide it down into four groups so that at any particular day, your student is coming to school with just five students. In regards to scheduling, because we know of all the various um, home situations and folks with work schedules, and we certainly want to be very cognizant of supporting all of our families. We will not expect students to be online at the same time as their normal classroom instruction would be occurring if they were face to face. Thanks. Okay, next question, please. Hi, my name is Laurie Bendall, and I am wondering with the virtual learning inevitable. What options will our kids have to meet their new teachers? Um, so basically, what will be the online, online platform to replace orientation night that usually happens the week before school starts? Um, thanks for everyone's hard work. I know this is difficult. It's Riley. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, in regards to orientation for students, because we're doing distance learning, we believe that it's important that all students as well as their parents and guardians have the opportunity to learn a little bit more and to have their questions answered about distance learning as well as meet their teachers. So when we start school on August the 17th, we will actually start distance learning at the same time. However, we will schedule individual appointments with each student and at least one guardian to meet the families face-to-face um, -face with the teachers. Uh, you will not be there at the same time as other students in your class. You'll sign up for a time that suits you. And we plan to have some staggered schedules because we understand that work schedules often keep parents from being available during the typical school day. Thanks. Next question. It's, um, a question in regards to our individuals who are on IEPs and 504 plans and how they will be able to access the supports that they are going to need um, on this virtual online classroom platform? Will they be able to have access to their teachers when they have questions, problems, concerns um, in regards to what has been set up in their IEPs and 504s in ways that they were able to access accommodations for um, extra support with testing, extra support in instruction, um, if they were able to get material that is in their 504s that they were needing for their educational purposes. Also, we were wondering what is going to be the accessibility of teachers during this time? Will there be any virtual classroom um, instruction where the teacher will be providing classroom instruction? Or is it just going to be uh, videos and PowerPoints that they're going to be um, interacting with and not have access to teachers? I know in the spring, um, some teachers had email um, that they could send to, and there was delay, sometimes significant delay, um, and when the teachers were actually responding to the students, I know I myself had to email the teacher in order to get them to follow up with my students' questions and concerns with the content that was in um, the platform that was used in the spring. Also, only a handful had actual Zoom meetings. Um, where they had scheduled times where they would meet with the students. Um, will this be a requirement that the teachers need to schedule meetings and have face-to-face -face time so that students can have some interaction with their teachers? I do feel that this is vitally important um, for our students and that they should not go nine weeks without having some sort of interaction with the teachers. Um, and if there's some possible way that the teachers can at least provide instruction from their classroom, since they will have access to their smart boards, they'll have access to the materials. Um, you know, having a small number of individuals in a building is not a high risk. So I don't see why the teachers wouldn't be able to go into their classroom, have a virtual learning experience where the kids can zoom in and get 
real live one-on-one um, teaching from the classroom setting um, and then have access to work that they can work on from home. So I look forward to the meeting and getting some of these questions answered and looking forward to see how the start of the year will go. Thank you. Bye-bye. Regards to students with IEPs, 504s, and I'm going to go ahead and add in our L students as well. Our teachers and staff are currently working on and have developed quite a robust list of accommodations that will um, be applicable to the remote learning. Um, having said that, these are going to be individual conversations with families. We need to, communication is going to be the key. Um, two-way communication and we're going to have to set up meetings with families so that we can make revisions to IEPs when necessary but also to develop an instructional plan individualized for these students that uh, so that we can ensure that they're getting um, equitable access to their teachers uh, and other staff members may I add, um, I think, sorry may I add I think um, the one comment about um, expectations of a reply from a teacher um, is critically important. I, I know that we can't always reply within 15 minutes, but, but we as a division need to have a discussion. What, what is a reasonable amount of time to get back to a parent? Um, that it, it should not be a week. Um, that has been set in the instructional portion of the reopening plan that it would be within 24 hours. That, that, that's awesome. So I just wanted to address that parent's concern. We, we need to, re we want to reply mm -hmm. and we need to do that in a timely way. And okay. now you still have a part to that. Okay, I so, do. Ms. Bridey. So we heard loud and clear and we were in agreement with the modules last spring were certainly not what we would like to do for students in the future. We have spent this summer training our staff on the online platform so that we can provide the instruction that our students deserve. Our teachers will be coming into the classrooms to work and to do their virtual learning. Um, we agree that they are safe to come in and that they're in their own classrooms and using the resources that they have there. Because of that, our teachers will be able to provide instruction that may be um, videoed in order for students to access it. However, we really are concerned with social interaction of students and teachers. So a couple of things, if we have Zoom meetings, not if, we will have Zoom meetings because all teachers have Zoom accounts, but when we have Zoom meetings, those will not be graded or required. We have to be really respectful of everyone's schedules and you know, some families are gonna have to provide home child care through their older siblings and, and we really want to respect the different um, situations of all of our students and so we anticipate that zoom meetings and live discussions and those things will occur regularly however we also want to be sure that we are not allowing students to get a better grade because they can log on at a particular time over someone who's unavailable and so we are updating our grading practices and that will be forthcoming from each of the buildings we do have office hours every day um, from 11.30 to 1.30. That's the time where teachers are expected to get um, caught up on all of their communication from the previous 24 hours. That's also a time that a student could call a teacher directly or a parent could call a teacher directly and have a conversation or have a Zoom conference or just a conversation. Um, the Zoom thing is very interesting because I think that that is really how we will address our extracurricular opportunities for students. But again, we are also concerned with the social and emotional development of all of our students. Thanks. Due to Mrs. Holmes' schedule, um, she's going to now have to um, leave and um, take care of some other things. And we'd like to really thank her for being here with us. Um, and we value the support of the school board and are here to serve in any way that we can to make sure we're responsive to the community. If there are questions that come up, uh, Ms. Holmes, we will certainly reserve them for the next uh, thing, our special meeting and make you aware of them, OK? So thank you so much. Thank you. I wish I could stay for the whole meeting, but I need to get to work. Um, I would like to again thank all of our staff. Um, I have listened to all of the questions and read the questions on Facebook, and I am sure that they will be answered um, in our town hall. So thank you. Thanks for tuning in.
I'm calling with a question. Now that we know it sounds like it's going to be 100% distance learning, um, I'm going to be having an incoming kindergartner who is um, very ahead educationally. And then I have a second grader who is special needs and receives some services from the school, including OT and social skills. So my question is, if it's 100% distance, um, how much are they going to be learning directly from the teacher? And how much is it going to be the parents going through the curriculum with them? Um, and if they are, you know, if, I, if, if they are receiving sort of, you know, like a Zoom style learning lesson from a teacher, um, if I have a kindergartner and a second grader, are they going to be, you know, having to learn? Are they going to both have to be on their devices at the same time? Um, so I guess I'm just trying to have a better understanding of what that will look like and how, as parents, we will be able to um, juggle, you know, children in different grades at the same time. Thank you. Bye. Both Ms. Brythe and Mr. Weed. From a special education perspective, you know, all of our services are going to continue. They're going to maybe look a little bit different in, in the remote learning. However, our speech services will continue, occupational therapy, physical therapy. Uh, we're going to rely on our therapists, our specialists, to reach out to individual families to come up with their individual plans. And um, it's going to, communication is going to be extremely important as we move through. And in regards to um, students and teacher interaction, again, it, it is super important. And we hear everyone loud and clear about having multiple children at home and being able to juggle those schedules and get students online, particularly if you have younger children, which may need more support. So having two or more of them online at the same time would certainly be a challenge at home. And so we are, um, we are being very respectful of that. Some of the um, online learning for those younger students will be in the form of Achieve 3000 for reading, as well as Dreambox for math. Both of those programs are computer-based programs that supplement what students are already doing. And so because of that, it's a game-like atmosphere for students that they can access at any time. So the teacher can go in and assign particular assignments to the students, um, but it's based upon where they are in, in their sequence of learning. And then, of course, as I mentioned previously, the physical um, interaction between the teacher and student is, you know, can't be done through Zoom. However, uh, virtually we are able to communicate and socialize to the best of our ability. Nothing will replace face-to-face -face instruction, um, but we will certainly make the most of our technology opportunities. Thank you. Yes. Sorry. I would like to add that, that emergent reading and number and number sense, um, learning, learning to read, learning, learning to do math, learning to love reading, learning to love doing math, is a, is a challenge that, that our instructional folks have, have worked, worked on. Um, you know, if I were a parent having to send a kindergartner to school, how, how, how is that child going to learn to read? How are they going to learn to do to do math, and I, I think um, what Lori and your team have come up with is a really exciting way, um, whether it's a game environment or whatever environment, to get kids um, passionate about what they're doing. I'm going to go ahead and add in there, too. As a father of five kids, um, I am extremely comfortable knowing that these resources have been purchased. It's a huge investment mm -hmm. that the district is making for kids, and, and it's good for kids and I would have any one of my five student uh, children students in involved in these resources uh, they are good for kids thank you next question please good morning or good afternoon uh, my name is Michelle Chu I have a daughter at uh, James Monroe High School I have a question uh, regarding Canvas um, number one, is it meant to replace power school? Um, and number two, um, if it's not replacing power school, um, what's the content? Um, I'm not understand. I'm not seeing how it differs right now. Um, also to, uh, when it's the beginning of the uh, just the cursory introduction to Canvas states that you will click on a class card. Um, 
is that going to lead to a video instruction? Um, I'm concerned because of the advanced and the upper level courses and my daughter's taking kind of um, not something that can be learned from a handout. Um, so I'm worried about instruction, not just materials, but instruction and how is that going to take place through the canvas? Uh, I guess it's an app. Um, more uh, answers on that would be greatly appreciated. Thank you. Mr. George. Um, Canvas, Canvas is a learning management system and uh, PowerSchool um, as, as, for, as concerned with parents is um, our student information system where we uh, keep records. So the difference between Canvas is that that is actually the um, learning module that, that they will actually be entering as a student and, and be uh, accessing the materials. And, and I'm sure Ms. Brady could probably talk a little bit more about Canvas right now, but uh, there, is a, there is a vast difference between those two, just, just so everyone knows. Um, all grade reporting will be done through PowerSchool. Um, Canvas is the, uh, is the learning uh, part of it. I heard Canvas described as a hub um, and I think that's actually a really good explanation of it. It's where things will be housed for students, including direct instruction from their teacher, um, chat boards, you know, assignments will be um, done through there, uh, submitted through there as well. Feedback on the assignments will be given from the teachers to the student in there, you know, as well as all the additional things that we've always had, email, telephone, um, you know, alerts, all of those things. And so in regards to getting students training, that is part of the um, introduction that we will be doing for our back to school events from August the 17th through the 28th, where folks can actually come in and sign up and, and meet with their teacher and get some of those higher level questions specifically addressed. But I think the parent also asked about high expectations. Um, she's saying that she has a very high achieving um, daughter and you know what are we doing to make sure that we're maintaining that high level of expectations um, and that's probably not a question that I can answer maybe maybe your team has discussed that but I think this parent really wanted to know you know there's high level of expectations how are we going to guarantee that her child is successful uh, thanks for the clarification on that I think it's important for us all to remember that the the standard for students has not changed, whether or not we are in school or not face-to-face. Uh, -face. We are still holding ourselves accountable to high educational achievement for all students. And so whether or not that is in a kindergarten classroom where we differentiate for a student who comes to school reading versus a student who is just learning their alphabet, all the way up through high school where we have advanced placement courses and IB courses, all of that has to continue and we value that. So all of the content and the high expectations that we have for students will continue through that Canvas platform. It will be delivered in a variety of ways and um, I think it, it really, it speaks to the dedication of our teachers that um, they really have been spending all summer working on these things. Their contract hasn't officially started but they are all dil diligently at work and I think that the families will be very pleased with what they see when we come back. Thank you. Next question. Hello. I have a rising first grader at Hugh Mercer. My name is Gretchen Pendleton. And my question is, if we choose virtual learning for our child, what do you envision the transition from virtual learning to in-person learning look, looking like? I know we'll have the option to transition them if we desire from virtual learning into the classroom. But I'm wondering if you're going to um, have them go in with a certain cohort of students. Are you going to hold them out of the school until you have a full class? How does that work with transitioning teachers from virtual to in-person? I assume that if we go from virtual to in-person, we'll change teachers. I just wanted to kind of understand what the thoughts were regarding that situation. Thank you so much, and thank you for all you are doing to make our kids safe. Really appreciate it. Ms. Bride. So ideally, what will happen, and some of this logistically is still being worked out. However, 
all students will be placed with a regular schedule as if we were opening schools tomorrow like we have every other year. So every student will get a schedule. Between now and the end of the first nine weeks, the students will be broken up into those learning groups to help us figure out how we're going to manage trans transitioning folks back in. So the conversation about students who are distance learning by choice, they will already be part of a group and part of a regular class. So it will be no different for them to transition back in. The challenge for us will be, and the reason that we need that time, is just to be sure that we have all of the logistical materials and things like that set for those students to return to class as well as ensuring that what's happening as part of the regular classroom hybrid model during the second semester, that that is really coinciding with what the student is doing online. Because you're right, we cannot have students working on one thing, distance learning, and then something completely unrelated as part of the face-to-face -face instruction. So we will be working very hard to be sure that those things um, really do align so that students don't have missed opportunities. Next question, please. Hi, this is Patrick Darby. I just left a, a, a message with a question. I just want to follow up a little bit. I have a rising sixth and ninth grader, so two students who participated in the distance learning at the end of last year. Uh, there was zero in instruction, essentially, from teachers remotely. It was all kind of a bunch of uh, couple worksheets and the students draw some things and, and sketch out some things and, and send it in just to get credit for completing things. But I want to know how you're going to teach the children utilizing teachers remotely, which is what this is supposed to be. Thank you very much. Ms. Riley. Great question. I, I cannot reiterate enough how different the modules last spring will be um, compared to what your student will experience um, in August and the first nine weeks. Uh, just as an anecdote, I was at a friend's house, um, socially distancing of course, a number of weeks ago and their child came out to the patio and said that she had finished her first JMU summer course and she was holding her laptop. And so I think um, when we think about instruction, we, we want to be sure that we're cognizant that everyone across the U.S. and across the world is making this jump. And so while um, when we first started back with the modules, we wouldn't say that that was what we wanted it to be. We have learned from that experience and the experience of others surrounding counties and universities. Um, you know, the university has been doing this for a very long time, and, and we certainly are uh, taking notice of the things that are being successful there and really providing our students with things that are not just here's a PowerPoint, now do a drawing in response, or you know, a paragraph about what you think. So it will be live and you know, actual instruction. Okay, thank you. Yes. Okay, next question. This is Rebecca Rubin, and our family has four questions. Is looping up still going to happen, or has it been replaced by the ABCD option? Uh, second question, if we choose all virtual for our child entering third grade, will she loop up with her class, or will she be in some other virtual classroom? Third question, if we change our mind on a learning option, say we switch from all virtual to ABCD or vice versa, how long will it take for that change to take effect? And fourth question, if at some point we choose to change from one option to another, say from all virtual to ABCD, will my child still loop up with her class as originally planned, or will she be placed into some other classroom? Thank you. So in regards to looping up, the students, I believe, pre-K through five, were asked at the end of the school year last year whether or not they would be interested in looping up, and we have been gathering that information. So to loop up means that you would stay with your class and the whole class would move up to the next grade with you. Um, we have received some mixed uh, feelings about that, so it will certainly not be the entire class. Um, and then the other issue that we have is once we divide a class into that ABCD option that you referenced, it will be an issue as to um, whether or not we can get the transportation of those groups to work out. However, we are going to do our very best to honor those looping requests at any point that we can. 
you had asked in regards to how long um, it will take to transition between um, distance learning and the hybrid face-to-face -face model. Uh, we are asking for a week just so that we can ensure that we are getting students um, properly placed. However, it has come up a couple of times, and I just want to be sure that I'm absolutely clear with everyone on this. Some of our staff cannot return to work due to their own health needs, and so they would be virtual um, just by virtue of, of medical concerns. And so with that in mind, it may be necessary for students to have a virtual teacher that's literally at their home um, teaching out to your student who's at your home. And then if you decide to transition back into the school and the hybrid model, we may have to then change classes for you just because we, we want to have someone face to face if we can. It totally depends on um, how many teachers per grade, per subject, have those medical concerns. And unfortunately, we can't answer any of those uh, because it really is just contingent upon individual staff needs. And of course, those lists will be changing as we get further into the school year. Thank you. Next question, please. My name is Sharia Cornegay, and um, I have more of a statement than a question. My son will not be attending school on site at all. There's absolutely no way that you can guarantee to keep any of those kids safe when they are around other people at home and their families are around other people. And the, the level of exposure that, that, that they could potentially have and be not be symptomatic and come to school and spread it. It's a disaster waiting to happen. And if a teacher, if a teacher is exposed, then who's supposed to come in her class and teach those kids? And if one teacher is exposed, the amount of children that they will be that that, that will be exposed to them in within a two week period is it, it's not acceptable. It's not acceptable. Reopening right now is not acceptable. It needs to be 100% remote. Or I will pull my child out and homeschool them. Thank you for the statement. And we agree with some of what you have um, mentioned there. And that's why we've reconsidered um, our way we'll deliver instruction in the first nine weeks. And then we assess and reevaluate everything that we're doing. Safety is our first priority for everyone concerned. Next question. Hello, my name is Suzanne Rossi. I have a student at Walker Grant Middle School. I have a few questions. One is, will students have the same teachers if they go two days a week in person or if they go to all distance learning? On that note, if they go back after being at home with all distance learning, will their teachers be different when they go back into in-person. Um, also, if virtual, do students check in at certain times, or can they do their work on their own schedule? Uh, I believe that's it. Um, oh, yes, one more question. How are students divided into A, B, or C, D days? Is it alphabetical? Is it by the classes that they are taking? Um, uh, I would like to know that. Um, the ventilation systems in the school, are they, uh, with the COVID-19 being um, uh, airborne, um, is there any consideration in having a special filtering system for the ventilation system or germicidal lamps installed in the classrooms to help with slowing the spread of COVID-19? So if you could answer that, that would be great. Thank you. Bye. OK. Um, Mr. George and then Dr. Everhart. Um, all right. I'll, well, I'll start with um, how students are divided into uh, groups. And basically, we had to go through uh, the city of Fredericksburg and create, like many other school divisions around us, districts. 
Um, each district uh, contains the same amount of students. And we'll, um, off the initial onset when with our 50% plan, we um, intend on combining districts. And if we ever have to get to the point where we're at 25% capa 25 capacity, we'll separate those districts out and only have one uh, 10 at a time. And the reason for having districts is um, siblings can attend together and so that it'll bring a little bit more regularity to, to the households. And second, it will um, speed up transportation as we don't have to drive throughout the entire city of Fredericksburg and put students on buses for extended periods of time. Um, as far as um, in person and virtual, you know, there, there's going to be some transitions that happen with that. Um, off the onset with, uh, with uh, distance learning that they will be assigned a teacher if at some point when we do come back to school, uh, they will hopefully stay with that teacher. If they decide to stay distance learning while other students come back on hybrid, there could be a, a switch in teacher. That's just the way it's going to have to be uh, with our staffing and with student or with teachers that aren't able to uh, attend school um, due to health concerns and, and they need to work remotely. Um, as far as ventilation systems, uh, I, I can, I'll, I'll start with a little piece and then I'm going to pass it over to Dr. Everhart here. Uh, we are um, setting all of our HVA systems uh, to bring in the optimal amount of fresh air at the given day, um, at the given temperature outside, so that uh, each one will be bringing in fresh air and no less than 10% at any given time um, is the minimum threshold. And if you have anything else to add. I mentioned this earlier. I mentioned this earlier, and I would like to say it again. A lot of our efforts have been spent on where the virus is laying on surfaces and how do we clean that surface? How frequently do we clean that surface? And in high, um, um, high use areas, how, how do we kill? Um, or do a deep clean of the virus. So a lot of our work has been spent on where the virus sits on surfaces. That being said, we're also looking at um, incoming air. CDC recommends um, making sure that we've got maximum amount of air, and, and we are looking at that. We are looking at air quality tests as well. So where we are right now is by going distance learning, that has afforded us a little bit more time that we can begin to investigate um, how, how the virus can be killed using um, air systems or, or other ways. But we need to investigate that. And with students not returning until October, that gives us plenty of time to do that. But you know, big, big thanks to the caller for that question. Thank you. Next question. Um, this is Keisha Swain. I'm wondering, during the distant learning times, will it be like a Zoom? distant learning or just virtual children would get online to do their learning module? Or will, they, will there ever be like a Zoom where um, students will be able to see their teachers actually doing a lesson? Yeah. Thank you. Ms. Briley. Thank you. So there will be opportunities for students to interact with their teachers and their classmates through Zoom. However, those um, we are pushing for those not to be graded activities because of the inequitable opportunities for students to get online at a particular time. The um, online learning, though, may be recorded lessons that this, the teacher has done um, so that the child is actually seeing the teacher um, instruct that as well. So a variety of, of opportunities for students and for learning. Thanks. Next question. Hi, this is Shay Stress. I'm a fourth grade teacher at Lafayette Upper Elementary School. Um, my question is, will staff be expected to come to school during normal work hours, or will we be working from home during this time? Uh, thanks so much. In response to that question, the expectations are that teachers will be attending um, school as scheduled for the new school year unless there are COVID-19 related health issues that would prohibit them from doing that. And of course, we will work with staff case by case basis depending on the, the um, situations that they're facing. So um, we will be in contact with you very soon because 
the first work days and all are coming upon us in about a week. So, yes. Hi, yes. My name is Christina Jackson, and I have a couple of questions for the upcoming um, upcoming town hall. One, my concern now that we're going to the first nine weeks of all virtual will be, will it be just like it was in spring, a module set up? If so, will communication with the teachers be better than it was in the springtime? I know for our situation, really, truly, it was only one teacher that went out of her way to um, schedule team Zoom meetings to actually get back to us with any questions. Um, so I would say the communication, if we're going to go this route, needs to be definitely um, stepped up. Uh, also, the computers that our children have, some of them have had since the third grade, and our Acer computers and are very slow. Um, so I'm wondering, are they going to upgrade on the laptops that have been given to the students? The next thing it would be is how long of a day um, are we talking for virtual work? Uh, will it be work that's going to take all day long? Will it only be um, considered a couple hours? Uh, that's a concern. And then my last one would be on testing, um, standardized testing. Is there going to be a requirement for standardized testing? Thank you. Okay. Let's hear from Mrs. Riley and Mr. George regarding those questions. I'll let you answer the computer question first. Sure. Um, yes, yes, uh, the answer is yes. We, we will be upgrading. Um, I will, let me lay it all out there just so everyone has a clear picture because um, I don't think that uh, a, a lot of people have a clear understanding of, of what we're trying to do. Um, we will be providing uh, iPads to any student that needs one in kindergarten through second grade, first of all. So uh, that practice will continue and, and we'll, we'll do that just like we did last year. Um, grades three through uh, three and seven, um, we are basically giving new computers to. Uh, grades three, when we receive them, so we have ordered these uh, several months ago and, and they're on their way. In fact, uh, they probably will be here in a couple weeks. So they will get a brand new computer. Um, sixth graders transitioning to seventh grade also will get a brand new computer, um, but they already have one and we, they are the last ones on the list to, to get their new computer. Um, so they will also, um, after that four years, and we do have a four year replacement cycle, so seventh graders uh, will receive a brand new computer. It may not be uh, within the first couple weeks of school, but it will be uh, sometime in September. And then ninth uh, through 12th also will receive uh, brand new computers that, that we had purchased this summer uh, for them as well. So um, yeah, the answer is yes, we will be upgrading those. Uh, our replacement cycle is, is four years. Okay. And then in regards to the modules, I think we've, we've, we've touched on that a lot. It would, certainly will not be uh, the modules that you experienced last spring, but we are extremely concerned about communication, not only from um, school to home, but also home to school. And so certainly within 24 hours, you can't expect to hear back from the school. Um, and, and we really believe that that should be the practice whether or not we are in a traditional school setting or virtually. So um, communication is always something that we are hoping to improve upon. And you are exactly right that even now it's more so of a concern when your children aren't guaranteed to see their teacher five days a week. The question about how long the school day will be is really contingent upon the age of the student and the level of the class. Um, so for example, we can expect that students that are in advanced placement classes um, will have to do work that requires more work, um, more time than someone who is um, in the third grade, let's say. And so that is, is certainly an issue, as well as just typical student work habits. You know, um, I live with a 15-year-old who is incredibly slow no matter what. So her day will be longer than um, anybody else's in her class, I'm sure. And then testing in regards to standardized testing. Right now, we 
have not been given any indication from the State Department that they believe federal requirements for standardized testing will go away. So until the federal government tells us that we can lift the standardized uh, testing requirements, um, the state can't do that. So as of right now, we are still required to give the PALS literacy screening, the WIDA language proficiency assessment, SOL tests, and then other um, benchmarking assessments throughout the school year. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bryady. I think that concludes all of the questions that we've received um, for the town hall. I'd like to thank the community and staff for calling in and giving us those questions. That's very important. They've been valuable, and we've heard them from different channels as well. So it's been helpful to um, address them publicly in this room. So thank you to the community and staff. Also, I'd like to thank um, the administrative team and, of course, our school board chairperson, Ms. Holmes, for taking the time to um, join us in this first town hall. As you can see, countless hours have gone into doing what would be uncharted waters for us. I've been in this business for 39 years, and have never been faced with the challenges that we have now. But as teachers and educators, we've been used to being ready for the unexpected things to happen. So we've had lots of training when you have 25 students in your classroom to know that anything can happen at any time. And so with that, that training's helped us now get to this level of what in my lifetime has been the most challenging situation I've had to be responsive to. Um, our collective goal is to provide the highest, highest quality teaching and learning experiences for everyone involved. And I couldn't work with a more competent, committed, and dedicated team of people to do this. And um, the community, you've been wonderful, you've been patient, you've been supportive, you've been um, responsive and we're here for you. No question is too minor or whatever we want to hear them so that we can get your answers because we need to know the answers to launch this new school year. So thank you everyone involved and we'll be in touch. We plan to communicate timely and uh, uh, in, in, the, in the more um, quick pace way in that we have to because from day to day we're faced with sometimes a whole new situation that we have to respond to. So um, just be on the lookout for um, more communications in all forms. We're about to launch our new website um, in August. So that's going to be extremely helpful in what we're trying to do as well. Any more comments from the panel? Are you all good? Thank you so much. And, communications and Ms. Laura Braxton Christopher and Ms. Josh Long are helping us as well. So to everyone, thank you and we'll be in touch very soon. This concludes the first Fredericksburg City Public Schools Return to Learn Town Hall. Thank you, Ms. Janet Holmes, FCPS School Board Chairperson, Dr. Marceline Catlett, Superintendent, and all of our panelists parents, staff, and community members. Thank you for your input and participation. We value your feedback as their reopening plans evolve. We ask that if you have a question regarding the reopening and recovery of air schools, that you please complete the Return to School Frequently Asked Questions form located on our Recover, Redesign, and Restart website online at www.cityschools.com. We appreciate your assistance to help guide our planning related to safely reopening schools in the age of COVID-19. Your input is crucial to helping us ensure we maintain healthy learning and work environments. Again, thank you for your continued support. <music>